is giving the presentation. Yeah. Um, does the microphone work? Okay. So, um, hi. Oh, yes. Now it works. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm happy to tell you today about uh, our work on TLS 1.3 PSK. So as most of you probably already know, um, transport layer security is one of the most important security mechanisms on the internet protecting billions of uh, HTTP connections every day. And uh, its newest version, TLS 1.3, was released in 2018 and already sees a widespread adoption. Um, namely, according to F5 five Labs, um, it has been the most preferred version among the top 1 million servers end of last year. So uh, structurally, um, TLS uh, is composed of two protocols. Um, first, there's the, the handshake protocol, um, which uh, is basically the authenticated key exchange of TLS um, negotiating a session key that is then used in the record layer to actually protect the application data. Um, using an authenticated encryption scheme such as AES GCM. In this talk, I will uh, solely focus on the, on the handshake protocol. Um, so the handshake of TLS comes in uh, basically three variants. Uh, first, there is the uh, full handshake, um, which uses public key certificates for authentication. And uh, this is the variant that probably um, most of you uh, associate with the TLS handshake. Uh, then there is the PSK mode um, that is mainly used for session resumption, and it um, allows for um, a more uh, efficient and abbreviated handshake by the client and servers sharing a symmetric key beforehand. And even it allows for um, the client to send early um, zero RTT application data to the client. In addition to the PSK only, um, there is a PSK ECDHE variant uh, handshake um, that uh, adds an additional uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange to provide forward secrecy for um, the session keys. So um, we will only focus on the, on the PSK handshakes today. So now if we uh, want to prove a crypto system secure, what we usually do is we reduce the security of the crypto system to some computational hardness assumption. For example, um, DDH. Um, and classically, this reduction is considered asymptotically. Um, this means that the security then, uh, the security proof then uh, gives us the guarantee that there exist sufficiently large parameters, um, for example, uh, the size of the diffie hellman group, uh, so that our scheme is secure in, in some well-defined security model. But if we now look at the real-world crypto system, where we usually rely on standardized parameters, these asymptotic results do not really give um, meaningful guarantees for a specific standardized instance of the crypto system. And here comes uh, the concrete security approach into play, um, making um, the bounds for running time and success probability explicit. And this then uh, re results in uh, bounds of the form as we see here on the slide, namely um, we uh, have that the advantage of uh, some fixed adversary A against our crypto system is bounded by the advantage of our reduction to the computational hardness assumption times some loss function L, which might or might not be dependent on the adversary. Um, this relation then allows us to um, uh, either chose um, parameters for our crypto system um, for a desired security level that are backed up by the security proof, uh, or even to check whether certain parameters uh, achieve uh, the desired security level. Now, if we want to, uh, if we have such a relationship, then we say that the security proof or the reduction is tight if the loss function L um, is independent of the adversary. That means, um, for example, a, a, a small constant. So the question now is how tightly secure is TLS? And uh, TLS 1.3 was the first version uh, that was developed in close collaboration between academia and industry. So there were already many analyses um, during the standardization process. And I would uh, like to focus today on the result by Dowling et al, um, as it's the most complete computational analysis that we have at the moment. And since we are focusing on the PSK modes, uh, let's have a look at their result on PSK ECDHE. 
So generally, um, their security proof reduces the security of TLS PSK um, to its building blocks. And these building blocks consist of a diffie hellman group G with a couple of finite field and elliptic curve options and a hash function H, which is either um, SHA-256 or SHA-384. And different uh, combination of these uh, then result in different um, levels of security. Here you see, for example, uh, a 128-bit security uh, configuration or 192-bit security configuration. And if we now look at the bound that is given by Darling et al. in a very simplified way, um, you see that uh, first they reduce the security of TLS PSK to its building blocks. And secondly, and most importantly, um, you see that this bound here is highly non-tight due to the quadratic factor that the reduction to the security of the group here uh, loses uh, in the number of sessions that the adversary interacts with. So the question now is whether this actually is a problem in practice. So let's have a look at some concrete numbers. So here you see um, four uh, different adversaries um, using different amounts of resources. Uh, three of which are against P256, that means we aim for 128-bit security here, and one is against P384, uh, that means we aim for 192-bit security here. And as a target security, we set um, the running time of uh, the adversary divided by two to the desired bit security level, which you see here in blue on the slide. So if we now compute the concrete values uh, for the bound by Dowling et al., um, we get the following. So in yellow, you, these yellow bars represent the advantage of each of these respective adversaries. And since you see here that every of these bar crosses the blue line here, this means that none of the configurations actually achieves the target security. Um, um, and um, another thing I would like to highlight is that um, if you look at the line here top that is um, highlighted in blue now, uh, is that um, the, this means that if a, the yellow bar crosses this line, that the probability of the adversary breaking TLS is actually one or less. That means from a concrete security perspective, um, the bound does not really give uh, any meaningful guarantee in this case. So the question now is whether um, the parameters for TLS are not chosen correctly, or if the bound is simply too loose and does not draw the right picture. And this is what I would like to talk about next. So um, we, as the authors of this paper, were uh, able, uh, independently were able to give uh, tighter bounds for the full handshake in prior work. However, uh, both of our works uh, have a couple of limitations. Um, the first one being that both of us make assumptions about the key schedule, um, the key derivation procedure of TLS, uh, which I will come to in the rem remainder of this talk, and uh, secondly, um, the signatures that are used in the full handshake for authentication um, have to be uh, multi-user secure with adaptive corruptions. And unfortunately, um, none of the standardized signatures um, for TLS satisfies this in a tight way. That means um, we always have an implicit um, linear loss uh, that seems at the moment uh, unavoidable. And for TLS uh, PSK, uh, we are now able uh, to give fully tight bounds in this work, um, mostly because we don't have uh, the bottleneck of the, the signatures anymore. Um, the only exception here is that we don't, uh, we, that we are not able to give a bound for PSK only with SHA-384, which I will come to briefly at the end of this talk. So uh, let uh, me briefly compare um, the bound by Dowling et al. with our bound. So um, our bound is tight uh, with a constant loss. And uh, doing the math, uh, you see you, we get the following values for our bound that you see here in purple. And uh, the first thing you should notice is that for each of these configurations, um, actually our bounds uh, easily achieve the target security. And comparing the yellow and the purple bar, uh, we even uh, see that there is a difference of up to 128 bits. And uh, one thing I would like to highlight is that one might argue that we only show the right numbers here. 
um, but actually the majority um, of the configurations we looked at um, um, yeah, I draw a similar picture. Um, so if you're interested in more details on the numbers, then I would be happy if you consider reading our paper. So um, the natural, uh, so consequently, um, we have seen that uh, the parameters um, chosen for TLS are actually justified, but the prior proofs were not able to draw the right picture here. So um, the question now is, why is this the case? So um, the full handshake um, and the PSK ECDHE handshake, both at its core, are basically a simple Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And for security, um, that means secrecy of our session key, we want to have that uh, our adversary here uh, that only sees the key shares, so G to the X and G to the Y, um, does not learn anything about our session key. And this is usually captured by indistinguishability from random. So to prove this, uh, one would reduce the security um, of uh, the, the key secrecy of the protocol uh, to the DDH assumption uh, by embedding the DDH challenge into our handshake. And this works as follows. So we basically um, take G to the A uh, as uh, the key share of our client and G to the B as the key share of our server, and then take our Diffie-Hellman challenge uh, in place of the Diffie-Hellman key. So if we now compute the session key, then we either get a real or a random key. However, uh, in reality, uh, the problem is that there are many, many sessions in parallel. So the question is, where do we actually embed our DDH challenge because we only have one? And the simplest an obvious uh, solution is to simply guess a client and a server and do exactly what I just told you. However, this induces the quadratic loss in the number of sessions that we already have seen. So what do we do? So fortunately, uh, Kuhn Gordon et al. Um, at Crypto19 uh, proposed a technique to prove simple DH-like protocols more tightly secure. And here, uh, the reduction then uh, works as follows. So we, first, we embed a re-randomization of G to the A in every of our client sessions, and a re-randomization of G to the B in all of our server sessions. And then um, we model the uh, key derivation of the session key as a random oracle. And here it is crucial um, that uh, for this technique to work that the key derivation function not only um, gets the Diffie-Hellman key g to the x, y, but also the context g to the x, g to the y that are used to derive the Diffie-Hellman key. Because then we can switch from a reduction to DDH to reduction to strong Diffie-Hellman, which is basically just computational Diffie-Hellman uh, with a DDH oracle. The interesting thing here to notice is that the adversary can only learn something about the session key if he makes a correct random oracle query. And we can use our DDH oracle by, by observing simply all of the random oracle queries the adversary makes and check whether there is a correct query among these, all these queries. And if this is the case, we can use this to solve the strong Diffie-Hellman challenge. And this allows us then to simulate the whole protocol in the reduction um, without committing to one session to embed our challenge. So a natural question that arises now is, if th this uh, reduction idea actually is a template for a tighter proof for TLS 1.3. So let's have a look at this. So here you see um, that the TLS 1.3 key schedule, uh, which is basically the key derivation procedure of TLS, uh, which is quite complex, it uses a number of HKDF extract and expand calls uh, to derive a number of keys but uh, the details are, are not important right now. The important thing I would like to highlight is that um, the Diffie-Hellman key G to the X, Y enters here above as DHE. And the context G to the X and G to the Y enter here in these function calls. So the important thing to observe is that they don't enter in the very same call. This means that the Kohn-Gond et al technique is not directly applicable here. But I already told you 
uh, that there were tight analyses or tighter analyses for uh, the full handshake. So what did they do? So uh, the first solution uh, by Davis and Günther um, is um, more or less the, the natural one because they um, just took the subroutines HKDF extract and expand and modeled them as independent random oracles. Um, to overcome the fact that the context is separated, as I told you before, they use careful bookkeeping to keep track of, of the separation, basically. However, there's a problem because HKDF extract and expand both rely on HMAC using the very same hash function they clearly are not independent. So the second solution by Tibor Yaga and myself is that we made the assumption that every major key derivation can be modeled as a random oracle. This has the advantage um, that uh, the proof becomes more direct because we can directly apply the Kungon et al technique However, uh, we only assumed that this actually is true and did not formally justify it. And um, due, to the, due to a similar reason um, that, that all of these subroutines here use the same hash function, it is also not inherently clear that this actually is true. So the bottom line of both of these solutions is that both do not capture that actually inside all of these boxes, there is the same hash function. So modeling these as independent random oracles is a bit fishy. And this isn't even the complete picture because TLS also used the hash function to hash transcripts and to compute max during the handshake. So it's even worse than it already looked like. So let me uh, briefly uh, show you how we address this in, in this work. So we use a modularization uh, using the indifferentiability framework by Mowat al. And intuitively, um, with this framework, uh, we were able to show that each of the key derivations of, t of the TLS key schedule behaves like a random oracle under the assumption that TLS's hash function is a random oracle. And this um, gives us um, the uh, tool to both capture that um, TLS uses only one hash function, but also that we are able to apply the Kungon technique directly in our proof. To prove then that TLS PSK is secure, we basically split up the proof into two parts. So first we show that TLS PSK is secure when we assume that every key derivation behaves like a random oracle and TLS's hash function is a random oracle. Uh, and secondly, we show that basically this abstraction of the key schedule behaves like independent random oracles um, is actually indifferentiable from the actual key schedule that is defined in the standard. So let me briefly show you how we abstract the, the, the key schedule. So we start uh, with the hash function H, so either SHA-256 or 384, and we assume that this is a random oracle. And from this, uh, we split this random oracle representing the hash function up into two random oracles, one for each purpose of the hash function. So hashing transcripts, and being used as a subroutine in HMAC or the, the component, uh, like HKDF. Um, from this, uh, we can rely on a result by Dulles et al., um, which basically says that if HMAC is instantiated uh, with a um, random oracle, then it behaves like a random oracle itself. Okay, so now we have a transcript random oracle and a HMAC random oracle, and having HMAC abstracted as a random oracle itself, we were able to argue that each of these key derivations that happens in the key, TLS key schedule um, behaves like an independent random oracle. And we use, therefore, um, the book, a similar bookkeeping technique as David and Günther already used in their proof to apply the kuhn gordner technique. Unfortunately, uh, the second step, so from one, one random oracle to two random oracles, uh, does not work in general. And this is what I would like to talk about in the last part of the talk. So here you see uh, first our abstraction, which is kind of simplified, but I hope it transfers the idea, namely uh, that we introduce a function for every key that is derived in the key schedule, which ultimately will be a random oracle. But why is this actually possible? 
So in the step from the HMAC random oracle to the 11 session key random oracles, we rely on the fact that the TLS standard uses explicit domain separation using labels, which ultimately allows us to separate each of these key derivations using, uh, in combination with the bookkeeping technique by Davis and Günther to basically keep track of each of these branches. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, um, this does not work uh, in the case from one random oracle to two random oracles because we don't have explicit domain separation in the TLS standard for the uses of the hash function. And this means here we need to rely on the structure of the inputs to distinguish whether an, an input is a transcript or whether an input is um, an HMAC call or an HKDF call, which is basically also just an HMAC call. And um, TLS transcripts, for example, just consist of TLS messages, which have a prescribed structure to it. And this prescribed structure, um, we uh, could leverage, uh, and we were kind of lucky, in almost every configuration of TLS to separate transcripts from HMAC calls. However, it didn't work in the case for um, PSK only configured with SHA-384, which means that we don't have a result for this very configuration, unfortunately. Um, to summarize, uh, we give uh, type bounds for TLS 1.3 PSK and show that the parameters in practice actually are justified. Um, we give a new abstraction of the TLS 1.3 key schedule that is used in the pre-shared key modes um, that allows for um, a less complex and more modular proof in the random oracle model. And we identified a lack of domain separation in TLS 1.3 PSK only handshake with SHA-384. Thank you very much for listening, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions to Dennis? Yes. Um, can you give a little bit more information about why the SHAT384 uh, case is not covered? Yeah, um, but so, let, let me, before I go, uh, the other thing is that there is a paper by uh, Bargavan and others showing HKDF to be indifferentiable from random oracle up to some corner cases. Okay, doesn't that apply to to this analysis? Um, I'm I'm sorry, I'm not uh, aware of this result, but um, I can briefly um, explain what the problem is with the so um, so when we have an HMA call. Um, we, we have keys that are, are like 32 bytes long, right? And they will be padded with zeros to the block length of the hash function, resulting in uh, uh, 64 um, bytes. Um, uh, so the key and zeros for the last 32 bytes. So the, the end of this will be um, either 36 or um, 5C at this point, right? And uh, the client hello starts with a, with a, with a version number, um, a random 32 byte nonce, and then the legacy session ID, which starts with a length field. And this length field can only take values from 0, 0 to 2, 0. So we can just check this very byte, um, whether it's 3, 6, or 5C, and if it's a case, we know that it uh, is a transcript or not. Um, but this was uh, um, this is was, uh, that we are not able to do that for the SHA um, uh, 384 case because we basically were in a region where there could be arbitrary bytes at this position. Um, I'm not sure at the moment. Sorry. Thank you very much. Yes, Nigel. Yeah, um, early on in the talk, um, in the non-PSK mode, the standard mode for TLS, you were saying that the um, you couldn't get tight security because the signature scheme was not multi-user secure, or yeah. not multi-user secure enough with a tight enough bound. Exactly. So uh, is there any signature scheme you could drop in as a replacement? Like, does Schnorr work better? Yeah, so there are uh, two signature schemes that are multi-user secure with adaptive corruptions at the moment. Uh, one is by Tibor Yaga and Christian Gjorsten, 
uh, Crypto 18. Crypto 18. And the other one uh, is, uh, I think, uh, by uh, um, Thibaut Yaga, Kai Gela, Celine Liu, and myself, PKC 2021. Um, and probably, I'm, I'm not sure, I think there was another one. But uh, um, yeah, there are a couple of options out, uh, out there, but uh, none of them is, of course, standardized. Yeah. Any other question? So just to the question, is the issue that there are no schemes with proofs? So is it clear that other schemes around fail to be multi-user secure with the... Uh... And uh, I'm not aware of this, but there are no proofs, okay. tight proofs for that. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. As a follow-up question, would you recommend to change the TLS standard in order for the proof to go through? Y yeah, this is, uh, this is um, a, quite a tricky question because uh, we would introduce a couple of more labels and especially we would need to change HMAC um in in some cases so um yeah this sounds a bit dangerous so um yeah we we have a solution in our paper um uh a pro proposition um a proposal sorry um to fix this but this is also just more like a, a hot fix than a, a long-term solution so okay. probably i understand have to be yeah all right uh i'm not sure sorry I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just like a follow up again. Like, so you're you're bus bypassing the need for multi-user security in this news proof. Um, yeah. So there are no signatures um, in, right. in TLS PSK because uh, authentication is done using the symmetric pre-check key. Right. And um, what was there a particular reason why it needed to be adapt, uh, you know, secure with adaptive corruptions in the previous proof? Um, yeah, so I mean, um, otherwise we needed to, you always need to guess the user for which, uh, the, uh, which the adversary attacks in the proof, um, uh, where it basically needs to forge a signature. And this can only be circumvented if we use multi-user security by simply uh, just being prepared in every session, right? Thanks. Yeah. Or for every user, sorry. All right. We're running late a little bit, but yep. uh, let's thank Dennis and all the speakers of this, this session.